Hi everyone, my name is Susan David and I am the author of Emotional Agility. I've been getting some amazing emails and questions from people who've read Emotional Agility or are interested in the ideas behind Emotional Agility. And so I wanted to use this opportunity with a brief Facebook Live to answer any questions that you might have. And these might be questions about the book or the concepts of Emotional Agility itself, or even just about other aspects of your emotions, other people's emotions, your children's emotions as you travel in the world. If you are joining us, please say hi in the comments and let us know where you're joining from. Every once in a while, I'm going to be looking over at my computer, which is next to me, because that's the way that I actually get to see the comments. So if I look over, I'm not distracted. I'm just reading the comments. So I'm going to do that right now. Excellent. So um, if, again, if you're joining me right now, it's Susan David, author of Emotional Agility, and I'd love to hear any of the comments that you have or any questions that you have about Emotional Agility or about any of the ideas. Hi, Reza from Minnesota. Justin. Hi, Justin. Good to see you online. Sasha. Um, I've got a great question from Sasha. Um, Sasha asks a question that I think is just really important. And... I was talking about this uh, actually at an event last night. And so Sasha's question is, what is the best way to teach small children emotional agility? Hi, Crystal. Glad to join. So Sasha, I think that's such an important question. And maybe I'll start talking a little bit about emotional agility in children. If you're joining now, I am talking about emotional agility and it's an ask me anything. I'll get through as many questions as I can about emotions in yourself, in others, and in the world around you. One thing that I will post online later on in this live is a link to my quiz. A lot of people have taken the Emotional Agility quiz, uh, 40,000 people to date. It's a free quiz. It asks you a couple of questions. It takes about five minutes. And from there, you will get a sense of what are some areas in terms of your own emotional agility that are really important. So how do we start navigating emotional agility in children? This is so important and especially in young children. The World Health Organization predicts that by 2030, depression, not heart disease, not cancer, not diabetes, but depression will be the single leading cause of disability globally. And one of the aspects to this is the recognition that our children are growing up in a world that is unprecedented in terms of its complexity, its challenges, globalization, technological changes, uh, artificial intelligence, job loss. These are real things that our children are going to be facing in their world. And I'm mom to a three-year-old and an eight-year-old, and it's something that I think about. How can I equip my children to navigate a world that is fragile and to navigate a world not as I want it to be for them, this perfect world in which everything goes well, but a world in which Life's fragility is inseparable from its beauty, and the beauty is inseparable from its fragility. A world in which they will experience heartache, um, difficulty where things won't go well around them, illness, and even in their lives today where that might be some of their experience. So one of the most important aspects, and I'm, I won't go through every part of this, I, I devote a chapter in Emotional Agility to this. And I actually recently was interviewed for an article for the New York Times called Teaching Your Child Emotional Agility. And we can um, put a link up to that uh, particular article because I think that article is, is somewhat helpful in describing some of these ideas. So welcome everyone. I see Rosie's here from Florida. Um, Tim is saying, so enjoyed your podcast with Rob Bell. Your book is waiting for me when I get home. I can't wait to read it. Thank you so much, Tim. The podcast with Rob Bell was just amazing and the response has been incredible with tens of thousands of people downloading it. So enjoyed 
connecting with him and, and really exploring these ideas with him. So in terms of emotional agility in children, this is critical. Um, one of the things that I feel really strongly about is that we grow up in a world and we live in a culture that very much tells us to think positive and to be positive all the time. No matter what is going on around us, um, we should just get our attitude straight and we should think positive. And one of the things that happened to me in my life when I was growing up was that my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I was 15 years old. It was a very lonely experience. And what I found is that my friends were struggling to even talk to me about what it was that I was facing. And so I would go to school on a Monday morning and I would have spent the weekend with my father, you know, in this desolate and traumatic experience. And my friends who were really avoidant and trying to protect me would not even mention their parents, would not mention father, wouldn't even go there because they were going to be fearful that it was going to upset me. And so I had all these people either avoiding or saying to me, just be hopeful, everything will be fine, just be positive. Um, but it wasn't. And no matter what our children are experiencing, whether it is jealousy, someone won't play with them at school, they frustrated with math because they say they can't do math. These are really real experiences in that child's life. And just in the same way as if we had to come home from work and say, I lost my job today, we would be so hurt if someone said, don't worry, it'll be okay, you know, dinner's on the table. A really important aspect um, to start to cultivate emotional agility in our young children is to help them to understand that no emotion is good and no emotion is bad. Emotions are just data. Um, hi Sloan, thanks for joining, glad to have you here. So to teach our children that there's no good emotion and there's no bad emotion. Our emotions have evolved as signals to help us get through the world effectively, to help us to understand who to trust and who not to trust to help us to deal with the reality of situations that we face. Our emotions are warning signals. Our emotions help us to discern our values. And so what happens if we start saying to our children, either overtly in the words or in what's implied is, you know, we don't do sadness or we don't do jealousy or anger is wrong is what we start teaching children is that they're good and bad emotions. And over time, what that leads to is the difficulty for the child to actually hear their own heartbeat, to hear their own emotions, to connect with their own emotions, to understand their emotions. So a really important first part of cultivating emotional agility in children is to recognize this that even though we might have grown up in an environment where we didn't do anger or we didn't do sadness or where there were good or bad emotions, it's really important to cultivate an environment where your child feels that any emotion is okay. There's nothing wrong with shyness per se. There's nothing wrong with anger per se. There's nothing wrong with jealousy per se. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying that because they feel jealous, they have a right to feel jealous and they should act on that jealousy, not invite the child that they're jealous of to their birthday party. Or because my son is upset with his baby sister and he's really angry with her and he wants to give her away at a shopping center that he gets to act on that. What I'm talking about is, is, is not about giving license to act on all emotions, but rather the idea that this is a space where all emotions are okay. 
This is really critical and it's not the way we are raised in our society and it's not the way we are often raised as children. You know, Ashley, Ashley just put a comment there saying that when her mom passed away suddenly, she tried to act like it was fine because she didn't want to bother anyone. Um, if she'd have been more comfortable, she likely would have been able to process that experience in a very different way. So thank, thank you for that, Ashley. I think it's a really common um, experience that we have when we're going through difficulties, feeling that there's no space for it. And so we hold that emotion in and it can take the healing process a lot longer um, when that happens. So one of the things that I talk about in emotional agility is this very beautiful idea. When I was growing up in South Africa, the Zulu people in South Africa have this wonderful, wonderful greeting. And the greeting is Saubona. So if any of you have gone through to South Africa, around the streets, you'll hear people saying, Saubona, Saubona, Saubona. And Saubona is just an everyday greeting. Um, Saubona means quite literally, I see you. And by seeing you, I bring you into being. This is powerful. It's so powerful for our children when they're experiencing any heartache or anxiety. They're going to a new school. They are concerned about their ability to do something. They're feeling frustrated is while our inclination so often with the best of intentions is to jump in and make that situation OK, you know, don't worry, everything will be fine. Um, I'll phone the mean girl's parents and make things right. Or trying to problem solve. Um, we want to jump in and say, well, if you just try harder with the homework, you'll be okay with it. And we're doing this with really good intentions. But a first aspect of emotional agility in children is doing actually what is least obvious, but most powerful. And that is simply showing up to them, showing up to their emotions, signaling to them that shyness is something that they're going to experience in life. And there's nothing bad about shyness per se. There's nothing bad with frustration per se, that you see them. This emotion is normal. It's common, um, not to delegitimize it, but that, you know, I experience shyness sometimes. I experience sadness sometimes. So helping our ch child to really understand that this is a normal emotion. Hi, Ant, and hi, Boris from Istanbul. So glad that you could join today. Again, if you're joining Katerina as well, please let me know um, where you're joining from and say hello in the comments. So a first aspect in emotional agility in children is to really try to just show up, not judging, not telling them in some way that the emotion is a bad emotion. A second um, aspect of emotional agility in children that's critical is from a very young age, helping our children to do something that is fundamental. And that is to both experience an emotion because emotions are valuable but to also recognize that their emotions can be observed, that their emotions don't need to drive them, that their emotions don't need to call the shots. So when I talk about emotional agility, and it might come up back to front here, but when I talk about this in emotional agility, I talk very much about this idea that a key part of developing our emotional agility is not to push emotions aside and to ignore them. It's also not to dwell on those emotions. So we want to enter into a space with our emotions that's healthy, where we can experience our emotions, we can be compassionate with our emotional experience, um, but also observe those emotions, that those emotions don't need to hook us into particular ways of acting. When a child is hooked, they might say, I'm frustrated, therefore I'm going to give up. Um, I'm angry with my friend, so I'm not going to play with them. So they're starting to, in that space, 
not have the capability to discern between an emotion is data but not directions. So how do we start developing this skill in our children? Critically, at age two and three, we start to have the ability to differentiate emotions. So for example, your child is really upset about something and once your child has calmed down a little bit, because often having this conversation when your child is on the floor throwing a tantrum doesn't help, but when your child has calmed down a bit, saying to your child, how are you feeling right now? Are you feeling sad or angry or scared? We know from research that age two and three years old, children start having this ability to, hi Laura, glad you could join, and Daniel as well. Thanks for sharing this video. Please feel free to share the video if you feel it would be helpful for people. So at age two and three, starting to say to children, what are you feeling? You know, what is actually going on for you? Now, what's interesting is that even though your child might struggle to do this early on, we know that when we develop the skill to label emotions, ultimately what it helps us to do is to problem solve around those emotions. So an example that I talk about in emotional agility is imagine as an adult, if someone said to me, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. And I then say to them, well, you know, there's a difference between being stressed versus disappointed or stressed versus anxious or stressed versus, I thought my career would be so different than it is and I'm really heartbroken at what I feel is a loss of the past five years of my career. What you can see is if I just took the person's stress on face value, then I might say to the person, well, why don't you delegate more? But if what's really going on for the person is that they're disappointed or that they are feeling that their career is going nowhere, then attitudes or strategies around delegation just aren't going to cut it. So what we start seeing here is that labeling emotions effectively is intimately related then to problem solving about those emotions. So this is really important um, if you can help your child to at a very young age and then as they get older to become more nuanced about what is it that they're really feeling and why are they really feeling that thing, it's very powerful. You can do this even in storybooks when you're reading to your child. What is Jack feeling in the book? What might happen if, you know, the person doesn't give the thing back to Jack that they've taken away? You're trying to help the child to discern different types of emotion. Um, I don't want to spend too long on this question because I know there are other great questions coming, coming through. Um, but, you know, what's really important here is showing up to your child, helping your child to label emotions. And in that process, they're starting to develop this capability to see emotions as data, not directions. And then really importantly is helping your child to understand what is important to them in the situation that they're facing. So often we, um, and, and I'm not making any judgments about this, I do it myself, but so often what we try to do with our children is use extrinsic motivators to get them to do what we want them to do or to do what they want to do. So for example, uh, a child who says, I'm you know, really scared to do something, we might develop a sticker chart, or we might say to them, you know, don't worry, don't be scared, um, do this thing, it'll be okay, and if you jump off the diving board or if you approach your friends or if you have this play date or if you do your math homework I will take you out for an ice cream or I will so what we often try to do is try to put external motivators into helping our child to do things and for all of us we know that when 
we have external motivators, often the external motivator will work for a short time. So we go to a job, we paid to do that job, we might find that job really boring and really terrible, but we do it because we're being paid. But after a while, we know the experience. That external motivator starts to lose its power and we start to become more desolate inside and our experience um, and our ability to motivate ourselves in that job becomes unsustainable. So we lose our engagement, we lose our motivation. So with children, a really important aspect of... Um, Brie, thank you so much for joining. So great to see you. So a really important aspect of this for children, and it's something that we don't get any training to do, and there are no articles really written on this idea, is helping children to find their own why, their own intrinsic nugget of why they want to do something. Because that is a very, very powerful motivator. So it's not I'm going to give you stickers or I'm going to do, but why is this important to you? So for example, um, I'm really upset with my friend, so I don't want to invite her to a birthday party. What kind of friend do you want to be? You know, what kind of friendship is important to you? And obviously the way we frame this question is going to differ according to the child's age, but asking children questions that help them to de develop a values-based identity. Um, an example might be that if a child is helping, they're helping with something around the house, instead of maybe giving um, you know, stickers or rewards because the child helped, and again, no judgments here because you know, we often as parents just do what we can, but we know from research that if you say to a child, you helped, you know, you helped me with this, that that is great, but it's not as effective as calling the child's actions in a verb. So you were a great helper. What a helper you are. What that starts to do is it starts to develop the child's identity or value base as a helper. And this is really important. Again, our children are going to grow up in a world where there are gonna be politicians and um, businesses and organizations and spouses and telling us what to do. And ultimately, it's really important that our children have their own compass, their own set of values that's critical because that helps them to be resilient and to be grounded as they move forward. I'll start closing with this question, but I just wanted to give you an example, and I don't mean this example to imply in any way that I did this perfectly because I, I don't think that I did it perfectly, but just to give you a very practical example of um, something that my son experienced recently, I've got a three-year-old and an eight-year-old. And thank you so much for joining Lo and Susie Lee. Really appreciate having you online. So my son, and I've, I've asked him if he's okay with me telling the story, and he is, um, I did a talk last night, so he's, he was fine with it. But my son is eight and recently went to a new school. And of course, all of the anxiety and concern about am I gonna fit in? And so we spoke about those fears and how other people might feel that are also new and how the teacher might be feeling teaching a new class. What I was trying to do was trying to create a space where he feels that this anxiety is normal um, and that other people might be feeling anxious too. But anyway, he goes off to school and within his first week, a child comes up to him in class and says that they are creating a secret gang and does my son want to join the secret gang and when my son questioned a little bit more the secret gang turned out to be um, a gang that the boys were allowed to join 
Um, but the girls had a whole lot of hurdles that they needed to go through in order to join this gang. And even when they got to join, they were going to have lesser rights in this gang. So my son was asked by this child, does he want to join? And on the one hand, he wants to be part of the group and is this new kid. But on the other, he doesn't because he feels uncomfortable with this idea that starting off very young, um, the women get lesser rights, the females get lesser rights, and it felt uncomfortable for him. So he said no. And what happened is he then had declined to join, but gradually every single one of the other boys in the class joined the gang, and he was now the one child that was not part of the gang. So this was a really difficult situation for him. And he came home and he was really upset about it because it meant that there were games that he was being excluded from. And um, he just felt that he had been doing something right and now it had completely backfired on him. So we had this really important, I just think it, it was such a powerful conversation with one another about not just how are you gonna solve the problem, but about the fact that equity and fairness are an important value for him. And we named it, we labeled it, we recognized it, we celebrated it. And that that is a really precious thing to know about yourself, that equity and justice are important to you. We also then moved on to trying to help him to solve the situation, which he did. He had an idea that he wanted to bring some of the kids around for various play dates and that ultimately, you know, that he would, this gang would fall away. And that's exactly what happened. Um, but this was really powerful. And about two months later, something again happened at school and he came home from school and he said, you know, mommy, I stood up for them because equity and fairness and justice are really important to me. So, you know, again, what's really critical here is when you help your child to understand their why, you're helping to build their character. And it's less about modeling these things for the child and much more about helping them to understand what their own why is in their life. I'm going to take two minutes now just to log in and to see what other questions have come through for people. Um, so I hope that was, that was helpful, you know, showing up, helping your child to label and helping your child to recognize that um, the things that they stand up for that are important to them, that are meaningful to them, that helps to develop their character. One really last um, aspect to this is and, and Susie, I see, you know, Susie, you're saying it evolves. Absolutely, our values evolve over time. Our children's values evolve over time. We shouldn't get hooked into our values in ways that stop us from being effective and, and successful. Um, our values evolve. One other aspect that I think is really important with this is, and this applies both to children and adults. I saw there was a question earlier about, you know, how do you deal with fear? So again, so much of the narrative in society tells us that only when you get rid of your fear will you be able to do what you want. Like get rid of your fear, develop comp confidence, and then apply for the job. Um, get rid of your fear about being an entrepreneur and then start your business. There's a lot of narrative about how to get rid of anger, fear, these difficult emotions. And I actually think that we've got it all wrong. Our emotions have evolved when we try to get rid of, push aside, those emotions actually come back. Um, we amplify them, we try to get rid of our fear before giving a talk, and we feel more fearful. So. One of the things that's really important is to help us to recognize that even when we are feeling fearful, we can be compassionate with our fear, 
Hi, Janet. Thanks for joining. And Greg, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Greg, yeah, exactly what you, you, you're talking about now. You talk about how courage is fear walking. You know, how do you do this? So instead of developing this narrative of our children need to get rid of their fear or our um, we need to get rid of our fear, instead to recognize that we can be compassionate towards ourselves, curious about what is the function of the fear, like why am I feeling fearful, what is really going on for me here, but to also recognize that our fear doesn't get to call the shots. So the comment earlier is this idea that I talk about, which is courage is not an absence of fear. Courage is not an absence of fear. Courage is fear walking. Courage is about being able to notice your fear, be curious about your fear. What is my fear telling me? What is my fear getting me? What is avoiding this thing getting me? Like, what is it buying me? And sometimes it's buying me good stuff. Like sometimes it's buying me comfort. Sometimes it's buying me not taking risks. Sometimes it's buying me not putting myself on the line. But sometimes it's buying me um, a lack of growth in my life. It's buying me not moving in the direction that is meaningful to me. So what is my fear telling me? What is it buying me? And how can I make steps towards what is important to me in spite of my fear? Courage is not an absence of fear. Courage is fear walking. And Katerina, I think you put a post on Instagram recently about this, or maybe someone else did, which is saying, you know, the really important thing about walking is you just got to take one step. You don't have to give up your entire business to become an entrepreneur then and there. You don't need to write the book then and there. What you do need to do is choose which one step you're going to put in front of the other in the direction of your values. And again, when it comes to children, and I'll not give any more personal examples after this, um, but I took my child, and I just want to give this example because it's so simple and small, but I think maybe helpful, is I took my little daughter Sophie out to um, a restaurant the other day. The two of us went for some one-on-one -on -one time. And she said to me that she wanted to ask, she's three, she ate some of her food and she wanted to ask the, the waiter, the server, for the rest of the food as a takeout. And she said to me, but she's feeling shy. And so she doesn't want to do it. She wants me to do it. And so we had a conversation about some, you know, shyness is something that we all feel sometimes. And mommy also feels shy sometimes. And it's a normal emotion. Is getting her takeout important to her? And if it's important to her, how can she make a choice in that moment to be brave, to be courageous? And what would help her to be brave and to be courageous? And so she said to me, you know, three years old, that maybe mommy didn't need to come with her, but maybe if mommy could just watch while she was doing it. So it's a small example, but, you know, I said yes, and she got off her chair and she like ran off and she got a little takeout. But it's this idea, you know, helping our child and articulating to our child and to ourselves that when something's important to us, our fear, our shyness, our anxiety doesn't have to call the shots. That we can choose courage over comfort and we can put one step in front of the other. Tiny steps, it doesn't need to be big, it doesn't need to be huge but courage is fear walking. I'm going to look at some other questions. Um, so Justin, thank you so much for joining. And Justin, thank you for also posting this question on the Facebook page. So Justin says, and just by the way, if you're joining, thank you so much. Please let me know where you're joining from and say hello. And if you've got any questions, 
please put them online. Um, I probably won't get to answer all the questions now, but I'm going to do this fairly regularly and we're going to keep a list of the questions that people are asking so to be um, followed up in future. So Justin says, for people who are looking at emotional agility for the first time, where do you start? Like what's the very, very first step that you would um, encourage people to think about? So I think that's such a great question. Um, I think it would be this. There, there are probably different things that I could choose, but I think it would be this. To try to um, not fight what you feel. So to simply open your heart to the different emotions that you experience and to open your mind to the different emotions you experience. In Emotional Agility, and if you're just joining me, um, this is a Facebook Live, ask me anything about Emotional Agility. In Emotional Agility, I talk about how often people land up either doing bottling, where they say to themselves, I'm just not gonna go there, I'm upset with my job, but I'm just not gonna say anything, or I'm upset in this relationship, it isn't working out, and they bottle, they just ignore those emotions. And as I say this, you know, if this connects with you, if you're a bottler, please feel free to let us know. It's, you know, helpful to just get a sense of where people feel they are. Um, so bottling emotions, pushing emotions aside, or we can do what we call brooding about emotions. And brooding is where with very good intentions, we move into a place of rumination. Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? This is terrible. This is awful. Um, you know, this is, and all of this is basically, whether it's bottling or brooding, even though it's done with really good intentions, um, thank you for the lovely comments, Sasha, um, around the children. I hope that was helpful. And thank you, Anne, for joining. And Anthony says, thank you. You're inspiring so much to develop my songwriting project. Well, please let us know how it goes. Move forward with that because the work you're doing is really important. It's important to you and it's important to the world. Um, so just a first aspect when we are bottling or brooding emotions, what we're doing is we are spending so much time in our head hustling and jostling about whether an emotion is okay or not okay that we're not spending enough time in our lives actually dealing with the situation. So. Justin, in answer to your question, what I would try to cultivate is simply ending any struggle by dropping the rope. Ending any struggle you have with whether an emotion is good, bad, right, wrong, should be felt, shouldn't be felt, by dropping the rope. Um, just to be clear, this doesn't mean, when I talk about this, what I'm talking about is acceptance. It doesn't mean resignation. It doesn't mean acceptance of your circumstance. It doesn't mean that the emotions are right and should be acted upon. All it means is that you are opening your heart to seeing yourself. And in the same way as Saul Borna, I see you and by seeing you, I bring you into being. When we open our hearts up to what we feel, we help to bring ourselves into being. So first step is, are you bottling, brooding, pushing emotions aside, trying to be happy, trying to rationalize, or are you ending the struggle by dropping the rope, cultivating willingness and acceptance around your emotional experience? So thank you so much. Susie says, my mother was a bottler, so I do some of both but I use my tools to break loose and to reconsider. So I'd love to hear, you know, are you a bottler? Are you a brooder? What are some of the tools that you use to help yourself to either face the situation or to stop dwelling on it in a way that you can actually um, move forward productively? So thanks, Justin. I hope that was helpful. Any other questions? I've got, I'm doing a talk tonight. Um, uh, just in Boston at the Brookline Community Center and I probably need to go in about the next 10-15 minutes so I can go and give that talk um, which is it's it's actually about people struggling in the community with these 
very issues that we're talking about, but where they're feeling held, feeling held back in real ways. Um, so are you a bottler or a brooder? Um, and that's a question that I'm asking you, but actually, you know, sometimes what I do myself is I tend to be more of what I call a flipper, where I'll sometimes brood about something and then I'll say, you know, I'm thinking about it too much, I'm going to push it aside. And I've become, I think, better over time with, again, just opening my heart to what is it that I'm feeling here and what is the function of that emotion? If I'm feeling guilty, I'm traveling a huge amount and I'm feeling guilty, instead of saying, well, my guilt is a fact or I shouldn't feel guilty or I should feel guilty, what is my guilt telling me? What is the signpost of my guilt? Um, what is my guilt trying to help me recognize is important? Because so often underneath our emotions are values. Um, for me, when I feel guilty, you know, what it's saying to me is being a present parent is really important to me. And that maybe at that time, it's a little out of whack. So, you know, opening myself up to the value, the signpost that's beneath that emotion. So I'm going to take one more question and there's some amazing questions coming through. I'm going to be doing this fairly regularly on a Thursday, so I will definitely store some of these questions. They're great. Um, so, um, Andrea, if you have time, could you talk a little bit about how to practice emotional agility if you have a narcissist in your family? It seems as if narcissists have an extraordinary ability to keep even emotionally healthy people hooked because they understand how to train their targets to ignore their gut feelings and instincts. What is the best defense? What if no contact isn't an option? So I think, you know, that's a great, I mean, it's a really important question. Um, we can practice our own emotional agility, but sometimes people around us conspire either overtly or covertly or even without realizing it to draw us in. And so I think some really important um, parts of this are to firstly try to understand for yourself what triggers you to be drawn into a particular dynamic that isn't effective. Different people get drawn in in different ways. And being very specific about, you know, it's when my parent says this or when the person says that, it evokes anger or shame or a feeling that I'm not good enough or... So what is the specific trigger that enables that person to move into a space that is a boundary space where you feel that you're struggling in that context to um, engage effectively, engage in a way that is valued, values aligned. So the first thing that I would say is to um, try to discern what those triggers are. A second really important aspect of this, and this actually um, connects also with one of Lomara's questions who says, what are some concrete and tactical strategies to get unhooked when your mind has almost been wired for so long to the point that it's habitual. So again, you know, when we grow up in a family where we're walking on eggshells or we, where we're dealing with particular family members, it can become really difficult because they often lands up being a very habitual way of responding. And that response might not work for us, but we do it. So one of, this is gonna sound really simple, but when you're feeling hooked and when you're feeling drawn in, simple is best. So it's this. Name your thought or your emotion for what it is. So I'll give you an example. Imagine you sitting in a meeting and you're saying to yourself, I'm feeling undermined. Uh, this person's undermining me. You know, I'm just going to shut down. Or my spouse is starting in on the finances. I'm just going to walk out the door. What you're doing in that circumstance is you're hooked. There's no 
space between stimulus and response and your emotions are calling the shots. So noticing your emotions and thoughts for what they are. So you know what your traditional triggers are and just saying to yourself, I'm noticing the feeling that I'm being undermined or I'm noticing the feeling of anxiety or I'm noticing the thought that I should leave the room or I'm noticing the urge to shout at the person. So this sounds really simple. All you're doing is you are labeling instead of saying, I am being undermined. I am going to shut down where there's no space between stimulus and response. Instead, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm noticing the feeling that I'm being undermined. I'm noticing the thought that I'm going to shut down. That very, you know, one tech strategy is simple but so powerful because what it does in Viktor Frankl's terms, and I talk about this in my book, Emotional Agility, I talk about how Viktor Frankl describes this powerful idea that between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose. And it's in that choice that comes our growth and freedom. But of course, you can't create the power to choose, to insert values, to have growth and freedom, unless you do the space between stimulus and response. I'm noticing the thought that, I'm noticing the emotion that, I'm experiencing butterflies in my stomach, I'm noticing. Very powerful way of starting to create space. So I am so grateful to you for joining. Um, for those of you who have recently joined, this was a Facebook Live, Ask Me Anything, and I'm going to do them fairly frequently. Um, if you haven't read Emotional Agility and want to explore some of these ideas more, obviously they're in the book. Um, but other things that I've recently done that have connected with people and that convey some of these ideas, I think, in a way that, that feels articulated in a way that people are responding to is firstly uh, Rob Bell. I did a podcast with Rob Bell last week and Rob Bell, um, if you're interested in these ideas and you want to just get a little bit more of them, feel free to download his podcast which came out last week and um, we explore some of these ideas more there. Um, my quiz, I've got a quiz that I developed that we've now had about 40,000 people take, which is at susandavid.com forward slash learn. And I'll put the link in to the comments as well so that you can access that. If you haven't taken the quiz, it's a really brief couple of questions, takes a couple of minutes, but enables you to ultimately get a sense and you get a free 10 page report uh, around some aspects of your emotional agility and a lot of people are finding that very helpful. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for the questions. If you asked a question that I haven't responded to, please know that I'm going to be keeping all of these questions and that we'll be coming back to them in future Facebook lives. So I appreciate you being here and thank you so, so much. Goodbye.